Well, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be back at the India Ideas Conclave uh, in Goa, uh, which, you know, is really the only uh, gathering of its kind that I know of in South Asia. There's nowhere where you get this level of interaction and debate from people coming from quite different places and different ideological positions uh, and so forth. And I think the title, Democracy, Development, Dissent, is a wonderful one and an encouraging one uh, for India. So I would want to begin on this subject of foreign policy by just taking a very brief uh, tour d'horizon, a tour of the horizon, uh, because I guess I'm more pessimistic than Daniel Twining about the state of the world, the future uh, of the world at the moment. Um, you know, I don't want to dwell upon the subject of the U.S. elections because uh, it's, it's one of those subjects that everybody globally is so fascinated with, the idea that Donald Trump could actually, within a week, become president of the United States. Uh, it, it, it makes your hair stand on end just to consider that uh, possibility. And yet it is a real possibility, and it is one that even if it doesn't happen, we'll have a ripple effect, a destabilizing effect, uh, I think. Uh, you only have to look, for example, at the preparations, the defensive preparations going on in the Baltic states at the moment against the possibility of a Russian invasion to see how real it is, to see how a few words in a presidential campaign saying, well, maybe some people uh, will not get the full protection of NATO, to see what the consequence is uh, thousands of miles away across uh, the globe. You then look at the United Kingdom, my own country, and the extraordinary constitutional instability generated by the vote in favor of Brexit, in favor of exiting the European Union, and the great uncertainty about how that can be uh, implemented. And then, of course, if you go to West Asia, you see terrifying instability and civil war and not only civil war, but also proxy war going on in countries like uh, Syria, of a kind which we know is not going to stop uh, anytime soon. And that instability comes right up to India's western uh, border. And then if you look east, you look at uh, elements of radicalization in a country like Indonesia. Uh, you look at a country like the Philippines, uh, with the bizarre statements that have happened there uh, by the leadership against the United States. And of course, the actions of China in the South China Seas and elsewhere, uh, almost creating a new kind of global reality, a new shape to the world, where you look at institutions like NATO uh, or like the United Nations, uh, generated as it was out of the after effects of World War II. You even look at, for example, uh, the World Bank or the IMF, uh, all of these structures, and you realize that we are now at a point where India is required to make its own reality globally, where all sorts of things of the way that the world has put together uh, a quasi-rules-bound system are now up for grabs, and it's very, very uncertain how that's going to play out. I think that puts a huge demand on India to reconfigure or rethink its uh, foreign policy, and also to keep it dynamic. Uh, that's one of the strangest things, that areas that we assumed were going to be stable, or systems we assumed were going to be stable, uh, are now shaking. We don't know if they will survive. Uh, the idea that, f uh, from my own point of view, NATO or the EU, these kind of bedrocks of my childhood, could actually be potentially disintegrating, uh, is a very challenging uh, thought. And I'd just like to read a few lines from a letter that uh, India's first prime minister wrote in 1952 to the chief ministers. In this dangerous and threatening state of the world, what are we to do? We cannot play a major part, but we can perhaps play some part in either hastening or averting catastrophe. If we line up with either of the major contestants for world supremacy, we give up such little influence we might possess in averting catastrophe, and in that sense, we hasten it. The only policy we can pursue is one of non-alignment with the power blocks and trying to maintain friendly relations with all countries. 
And I guess really that is to a large extent what India has gone on to do, to try to seek to maintain good bilateral relations with all sorts of different countries. So India can be friends with Russia, friends with Iran, friends with the United States. That kind of span of countries which are very much in sometimes violent opposition to each other uh, is something that India somehow has managed to pull off. But linked to that, I think, is a, a new dynamism, an idea that India still represents a civilizational uh, idea that appeals very widely uh, to people of South Asian origin and beyond. It's noticeable, for example, that the United States census, that people of Bangladeshi origin, around 40% of them, in the category where you have to say what group you come from, what racial group you come from, will describe themselves as Indian. The same is true of 22% of people of Pakistani origin. They will describe themselves fundamentally as Indian. And I'm not talking here about very uh, much older people who were born in undivided India. I'm talking about younger generation, people in middle age, who still see some kind of aspirational link, if you like, to an Indian uh, identity. And I think that is something that uh, India now is starting to perhaps fully understand and implement in a way that it hasn't in recent decades. And what I guess that comes down to is the fact that foreign policy ultimately is not transactional. It is aspirational. Uh, and of course, Mr. M.J. Akbar knows this better than anybody. It, it, you know, diplomacy is an art uh, more than it is uh, a science. You only have to look at great moments of foreign policy. You look at, for example, the Bandung Conference in 1955 and the way that you can have figures like uh, Kwame Nkrumah or Ho Chi Minh uh, or Nehru himself or NASA all gathering and trying to uh, conjure up a new idea, a new vision of how the world is going to uh, operate. Or you look at John F. Kennedy uh, in, in Berlin saying, ich, ich bin ein Berliner. Uh, ultimately, foreign policy is, some, is about uh, inspiring people. It cannot be purely uh, transactional. So what then if we look to India? It's a difficult thing to do, of course, to r remove your own perception of India and try and have the view of others looking in from different parts of the world. Well, I guess what you end up seeing is the idea that we uh, believe in democracy development and dissent. And I, and I use the we deliberately. I'm talking here as an overseas citizen of India, not only as somebody who comes from somewhere else. And I think that that idea of democracy being stable and enduring, the fact that the naysayers like Winston Churchill, who said that democracy could not operate uh, in India on a universal franchise, that is something that today is more attractive than it has ever been because of instability in other countries. And again, the idea of flexibility, the fact that India chose not to, for example, ban people from speaking certain languages, as happened in countries like Turkey or Sri Lanka, with catastrophic uh, effect. Or again, that nationalism in India can be expressed as something that is not only about saber-rattling of a kind that, for example, you see in Russia, where you end up with neighboring territory uh, being annexed in the 21st century. And then development, you see the fact that India, for all the stops and starts, is now one of the fastest growing economies in the world. That is an extraordinary thing for people uh, who are ticking along at 0.5 or 1 or 1.5% uh, growth in, in other parts uh, of the world. And I, I would say that on, the, on that question of development, the real challenge, the biggest challenge now, uh, at least for those of us who live in Delhi or in North India, is pollution. Um, this is something that strangely has been often absent from political discussion, but we are now at a situation where the air quality index in Delhi today has hit 1,200. In Beijing, when it hits 400, factories close down, shops close down, children don't go to school. 
this is a public health emergency not over the horizon, but a public health emergency right now, which is going to result in large numbers of deaths from respiratory and other diseases. And I found it very noticeable already this year that at street level, at ground level in Delhi, this is now a major concern in a way that it wasn't before. And I think that uh, the canaries in the coal mine, if you like, in, you know, in, in, in the United Kingdom, when miners were working uh, in the 19th century and we still had operational coal mines, they used to keep uh, bird cages with canaries in. And when the canaries stopped singing and dropped down dead, it meant there'd been uh, an arrival of gas inside the mine. So the miners would then have 10 minutes to, to get out. Um, and I think that very soon we're going to start to see the canaries in the coal mine in the form of uh, foreign agencies, uh, foreign governments and their diplomats seeing Delhi as a danger posting with a potentially very damaging effect on uh, India's credibility as a place of economic development. And then thirdly, we believe in dissent. We believe in the idea of loyal opposition. And that can be on a whole range of issues. It can be small practical things like uh, geospatial information regulation, which now means that you can't uh, produce something on the internet or print a book, which shows, for example, past border disputes between India and other countries because it's illegal to represent those borders. Uh, it can be dissent on that. Uh, it can be over the idea that reporters, in some cases, are painted as being anti-national because they report in a certain way. It can be challenging the idea that extrajudicial killings may be happening in India of people who are suspected of a crime. It can be saying, well, the closing down of foreign NGOs, as happens in Russia, is not something that we want to do in India. Uh, it can be, for example, saying that Pakistani actors should be allowed to appear in India and perform in films, because what's happening now is that you're seeing Indian DVD shops in places like Karachi and Lahore being shut down. Uh, and the last place we saw that, of course, was uh, in places like Swat and Mingara and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa by the tariq taliban Pakistan. Uh, so in a sense, it's always doing their work for them. The, the danger to India, the people we need to keep out of India, are the uh, Pakistani jihadis, not the Pakistani actors. So, so to very quickly pull those three things together, I think what is very remarkable about India, if you read the Constituent Assembly debates, is that you have people of radically different political opinions all debating and interacting with each other. If you think people are politically split today, go back and read what they were saying and debating in 1946, 47, and 48, and 49. Uh, and that idea of democracy and dissent being written into the Constitution is a true global example, particularly at a time of such global uncertainty and instability. Uh, at a time of, for example, the US uh, election where large numbers of people are being discouraged from voting because they come from the lowest social sections. Even as in India, those very same people are the ones who in the largest numbers turn out uh, to the polling booths. So to conclude, I would say that the visionaries amongst us are already seeing a new world order where India offers an inspiring idea of itself to the world. Thank you.